Um, I'm very happy to, 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 to be able to work with our um, trade and investment committee, David Chow, who is also a co-chair of my counterpart, uh, and also agreed to, he, David also agreed to be the, the uh, moderator today, which we know it's not an easy job. Um, what I only want to say is that um, we, this series is, a, is, a, is a, uh, the third part of the uh, four um, events. Um, the first one is already, it's focusing on digitalization, and the second one is focusing on diversity. This, today's is, we're gonna focus on China, uh, which is about the future of the China supply chain. We also have a next series coming up, which will be December, and uh, we're focusing on sustainability. Um, last, um, I wanted to make sure, I see a lot of people join us. A lot of them are familiar face, but also a lot of people are not yet joining um, M, M Chen as members. We really encourage you to join them. This is just one of the good example that how much you can um, get in terms of uh, uh, being a member. There's a lot more um, coming as well. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to David Chow. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today in our uh, webinar series on the future of supply chain. My name is David Chow. Um, as Sally said, I'm the co-chair of AmCham's Trade and Investment Committee, along with Barrett Bingley. So um, echoing Sally's uh, point, if you find today's uh, webinar interesting, uh, please make sure to join us in our next session for the next webinar, um, as well as considering joining AmCham as a member. Um, I'm also the global market strategist for Invesco in Asia Pacific. Invesco is a global investment manager. We manage over 1.2 trillion US dollars, and I'm part of our wider global thought leadership team. So our team creates a wide variety of thought-provoking commentary and presentations for our clients in order to help them decipher uh, current market conditions. Now, before I start, I'd like to do a quick uh, participant poll. Uh, if, uh, Margaret, you can put up the poll right now, I'd like to ask um, all our participants to consider a very pressing question right now. So the poll in question here, um, I can't really see the, the results yet, but perhaps we will share those results with you later um, on uh, whether companies are actually shifting, whether your companies are currently or planning to shift production out of China. And the poll results show, yes, uh, approximately 40% of respondents in today's call says that they are currently or planning to shift production out of China. 28% uh, say no, and the rest um, say it's not applicable. But I think that's a very uh, interesting statistic um, and one that we will review over today's webinar. So thanks, Margaret, for that. In conjunction with today's webinar, uh, my colleague Adrian Tong and I will actually be publishing a white paper um, as part of Invesco's Global Thought Leadership on the future of supply chain. So I just wanted to highlight some of these key points uh, and insights that we made from this white paper. So first, we, uh, we'd like to point out that Chinese manufacturing has really exploded over the past 20 years. And now Chinese manufacturing represents around 28% of global manufacturing output, which is almost double that of the US and triple that of China. However, cracks have recently appeared, you know, uh, rising manufacturing costs over China have really uh, pushed some uh, manufacturers to gradually move out of China. Uh, which started about you know five ten years ago and this trend has really accelerated over the past two years with the onset of the u.s china uh, tensions uh, the tech war uh, the tech decoupling pressures as well as the coronavirus which has revealed uh, the global supply chains perhaps over reliance on chinese uh, supply chains and so our our thought today is whether companies um, around the world and governments around the world will start to shift their supply chains out of China into other places like Southeast Asia, Mexico, uh, and South Asia. However, the picture that we currently see from the data is very mixed. Uh, from a capital flow perspective, FDI flows continue to be strong, uh, north of $120 billion, and FDI stocks in China are also numbering around $1.7 trillion. 
So anecdotal evidence suggests that MNCs are increasingly looking to adopt a China plus one um, and in China for China strategy. So these strategies predicate upon China's fast growing domestic consumer market and is also expected to reach a value of around $8.4 trillion by 2022. And so we'll have um, both our panelists, our panelists today, uh, be able to comment on those trends as well as you know practitioners to see um, if, uh, if what um, their plans are in the future for both uh, investment in China and, um, and for China. And so with that, I'd like to move it over to our first panelist speaker, Joanna Chua. She is the Managing Director um, and Head of Asia Pacific Economics and Market Analysis at Citibank. Uh, Joanna, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, actually, it's already lunchtime. Um, today, I'll just give a few comments, uh, more really from a macro perspective rather than a practitioner's perspective, just looking at data and trends and trying to pontificate what the supply chains will look like. Um, I believe uh, maybe Sally will put up my PowerPoint slides. So, or uh, Margaret, please. Oh, Margaret. Okay, sorry, Margaret. Yes. So, just a couple of highlights. Um, and as you know, there was already a lot of natural supply chain migration driven by changes in industrial cost structure, such as rising labor costs in China, that have already seen a migration of some of the supply chain, uh, obviously to places like Southeast Asia. Now, last year, last two years, the really, really big narrative on supply chain movement was the escalation of Section 301 tariffs of the US across a broad $250 billion worth of Chinese goods exported to the US. And these tariffs were as much as 25%. So this was another meaningful dent in terms of the competitive cost structure in China that raised expectations about supply chain migration. And what, what does the data tell us? Well, if you look at the left-hand side chart, what we did is we tried to look at trade patterns. Are there any signs that China's share of exports to the US of goods that have been subject to tariffs have they diminished and who has gained uh, in contrast? So what you see in the left-hand chart is you do see that US import share re relative to for, uh, early 2018 when these tariffs were not there yet, China definitely did lose uh, market share of imports of US to those tariff goods. And who were the ones that benefited? We saw it in ASEAN, we saw it in Europe, uh, we also saw it in, in parts of Korea and Taiwan. Here's the interesting thing about this data. A lot of people always talk about India as the potential alternative uh, kind of source of manufacturing uh, to replace China because of the scale and maybe the similar industrial structure. But if you look at India, there is absolutely no sign at all that India gained any uh, market share of US exports in contrast to China on the goods that were subject to tariffs. So what this left hand chart really shows you is really just to look at what you call trade diversion patterns uh, relative to early 2018, isolating it on goods that were subject to the Section 301 tariffs. And again, trade diversion may not have a meaningful impact on aggregate GDP if basically Malaysia is just shifting its exports to Europe and putting it to US. They're just shifting things around, but there's no additional production increase. So the other thing we have to look at when we kind of look at economic impact of any potential supply chain diversion is we try to look at patterns on investment. Have there been signs of capacity addition in relation to supply chain diversion, which would add more to aggregate GDP growth? And you know, ironically, last couple of years, there was a lot of talk about ASEAN, ASEAN, ASEAN. But in reality, there were only two economies that really saw a meaningful uptick in kind of capex that you could say is maybe related to this manufacturing supply chain that added to GDP growth. And that was Taiwan and Vietnam. Now, Taiwan, obviously, that was also partly a function of this whole, not just the tariff, but this entire technology war and related to IP protection, and also Taiwan creating this return investment program that kind of attracted some diversion of that high tech space to Taiwan. Not to mention that maybe some of the data is also confounded by the fact that we're having this kind of explosion of digitization and Taiwan happens to be in the forefront of that. Vietnam, Vietnam also saw a capex improvement. Again, I'm not sure how much of that was tariff related because there was a lot of things also going on in Vietnam. We had the FTA with EU. We had a lot of the opening up and the kind of the, the, the lagged impact of some of the reforms and previous FDI in, in Vietnam. But really, those were the only only two. And again, because last year there was this escalation of the trade war and uncertainty around that, uh, usually it's very difficult to move supply chain. These things happen with a lag. 
And since the trade war only really escalated in 2018, maybe we're only going to see it in investment approval, but we don't really quite see it yet in the actual investment data. So one of the things that we track, which you look at the right hand chart, is just to look at the trends in manufacturing investment approval. And you did see some improvement. You saw improvement in Taiwan and you saw improvement um, in, in Vietnam, but although it's come off. But actually in other places uh, in ASEAN, I think the two weak spots is, and unfortunately the Indonesia data is not here, but we don't really see any signs of palpable improvement in Philippines, in Indonesia. Thailand has been a lot weaker than Malaysia. Actually, anecdotally, we were actually more optimistic that because investment approval had picked up in Malaysia over the last year or so, and these things happened with maybe a 12, 18 month lag, maybe we'll finally see the investment kick in 2020. But of course, 2020, what happened? Cap uh, you know, COVID happened. So obviously there's been a lot of disruption uh, to this investment approval. So I think right now, um, if you look at the anecdotal data and actually look at the actual data, it's still a bit mixed. There is no mass sign of uh, kind of an increased CapEx production supply chain migration on the back of this uh, outside of Vietnam and Taiwan. So next slide. Now again, you know, we could do, I, I'm borrowing from AmCham, basically, you could do tons of surveys and obviously in any survey, it's very much dependent on your sampling of who is actually responding to the survey and what are the industries. And clearly, as David already alluded to, China for, for China versus uh, and other places, you know, it's very different. And obviously, if you're in financial services or in your sectors where China is opening up, you're probably still expanding. But I think that the takeaway that we've seen is, um, Certainly in some of the surveys that we cited from AmCham this year is even on the back of the pandemic. I think there was a lot of recognition of the need to diversify your sourcing because you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. So this China plus one. And what we find is there were twice as many firms wanting to move their sourcing. This is from the AmCham survey earlier this year. They wanted to move their sourcing rather than move production. And I think this is all part of, I think COVID has highlighted the importance of resilience. Uh, in supply chain rather than just about efficiency. But then when you look at the other surveys, and you know, this has again been mentioned, uh, again, I, I'm embarrassed these are really AmCham surveys I'm just sort of citing here. Uh, but for example, when you look at surveys of moving production, uh, there doesn't really, overwhelmingly, there doesn't seem to be, most companies still do not plan to move production. And the minority that say plan to move, so for example, 70% say they'll not move, and the minority that will move, uh, it tends to be that only a small segment of their production will move uh, rather than all of their production or a significant amount of production. So most of the production say only about up to 30% maybe will move, uh, and very small, like only 1.8% firm in this AmCham survey said they would move the entire production out of China. So again, uh, there's a lot of narrative about getting out of China, but the reality says it's really, really difficult to do and actually there's a lot of compelling reasons also why you will say stay in China and if anything it's more on the fringes it's more again as David had alluded to China plus one strategy um, the other interesting takeaway I got from reading on the AmCham survey that happened um, uh, the recent one in June July that was released in August is that um, they actually found that uh, more companies uh, more companies actually like there are five percentage point more companies than last year's survey uh, that do not plan to move production. So it seems like more people are it's even stickier than it was last year. And I don't know if that means that, oh, because US-China relationship has gotten better. I really think it's really just symptomatic that, you know, we have a global collapse in demand because of the pandemic. It's very costly to move production. So probably some of the changes in marginal changes and decision factors is really driven by the global environment that we're facing. And if obviously, if we have a big collapse of capacity utilization because demand is weak, well, why would you need to add production capacity anyway? You can just, you, you can just shift things around using existing production. So again, maybe sometimes these trends and supply chain migration, which are structural trends, can be confused or clouded uh, by surveys because right now there's really not a lot of incentive to move just because of, of the existing capacity that we're seeing. Uh, next slide. Now, in a lot of times when we think, again, you know, in a lot of the surveys, you know, again, ASEAN always comes out when people are asked on surveys, okay, what are the top destinations for uh, moving? If it was U.S. companies, uh, you know, it looks like ASEAN would be the first and then, and then maybe Mexico. Of course, for other Asian countries, maybe Mexico is not a big feature. Maybe it's more ASEAN. So a lot of times when we look at um, who are the potential candidates for migration of supply chain, uh, we do various exercise of looking at similar, in, who has very similar kind of industrial structure or net export similarity with China 
this is kind of an indicator we look at to just see who is potentially going to move. And what you find is Vietnam is very high. Actually, India is also quite high and a number of Southeast Asian like Malaysia. In fact, we once did this, this, this uh, export similarity, including uh, uh, like you know, 50 countries. And you will find that US is very, very low on uh, net export similarity with China. So you can, you know, Biden and Trump can go after, you know, let's go, let's move back jobs back to the US, but it's not clear to me that targeting China is gonna achieve that objective because again, they'll just move elsewhere. So that's just uh, one of the takeaways from this, this slide. Although it's interesting, even though India has similar net export similarity, as I said, no signs yet of any trade diversion benefit since the section 301 tariffs kicked in. Next slide. Um, look, again, I think we all know the story that, you know, in the end, part of the reason why most companies will not move is China is still a very important end market. Uh, so if you look at the, the geographical distribution of global consumer market, uh, and this is 2018 figure, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't updated, but roughly it's like 12, 13% of global consumer market. And I think in this environment, especially now with the pandemic, I think the pandemic has also highlighted that you, there's always a value to being closer to your end market. When things can, when you have a big shutdown of mobility, it's better to be closer to the end market. And I think China being such an important market is important. Not, not to mention that obviously, you know, China is the first to recover post COVID. I mean, we can all argue that consumption has still been a little bit behind production in China's recovery, but in aggregate, I mean, China is already back to pre COVID levels of output. If you look at cities forecast, global, uh, global output is not expected to go back to pre level, pre COVID levels of output till maybe end of 2022. Uh, and then for Latin America, it's like 2024. Uh, for Asia, it's end of 2021 in aggregate. But a lot of that is really because China, Taiwan, and Vietnam is earlier. And then India is actually 2022 or later. So again, I think when you look at the recovery, it just highlights not only China really being a source of importance for, for profits and revenues because of the recovery and the resilience of the economy. Next right. slide. And anyway, the other last thing I wanted to point, we, we've written a lot about this, but I, I think the other thing that we factor in is it, traditionally when we look at the economic argument for you know, rising middle class driven by rising wages and labor productivity growth because of FDI and investment, a lot of times the, the path of industrialization in East Asia was very much driven by manufacturing sector, creating high quality jobs that basically creates a middle class. And one of the, really one of the, 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 the evidence that we're seeing now is just, and this is very, this is very obvious, but because of the rise of automation and digitization, uh, what we see a lot is what you call premature deindustrialization. Like each incremental additional manufacturing relocation is per, per unit employing less and less people. So in a way, you know, uh, even the latecomers that are going to come, let's say if India benefits from supply chain diversification, and there might be some movement later on. If you're a latecomer of industrialization, you just you, it just creates less and less labor intensity and therefore less higher quality jobs because of a lot of automation and all this digitization. And so you don't create that what's called escalator jump in middle income class and labor productivity that creates a broad middle class the way China benefited uh, when they went into WTO in, in 2002. I mean, maybe Vietnam is the last one because Vietnam is a small enough country. They got into WTO in 2007. They were able to maybe capture some manufacturing jobs. But then once you go into India, Indonesia, when you're late and you're such a broad economy, you know, with big population, it's going to be harder and harder. And the other thing I wanted to point out is I think all this push for industry 4.0 and automation digitization, we've done a lot of analysis on countries that are also better equipped both on the infrastructure technology side to kind of take advantage of this automation industrialization. And although India has a big market, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the lower income countries don't do as well. And you know, labor cost is only one component of production. It, it's important in certain sectors like garment, but maybe it's not as important in very automated sectors and in industry. So this is why we have to factor in other factors such as you know, kind of infrastructure and crisis management on the back of COVID. And unfortunately, when you look at China, China is still very compelling when it looks at infrastructure, crisis management, the, the, the speed in which it can normalize production quite quickly. And I think I've pretty much exceeded my time and I'll, I'll pass it on to the Great. next Thank you. Great, thank you, Joanna. I appreciate your insights. Um, perhaps the data showing that it's more fiction than fact um, in, in terms of companies shifting production chains out of China. Now, the next speaker we have will be Wilson Zhu. He is the COO of Lian Feng. Uh, Wilson is joining us from, um, from China today. He's taking time off his Golden Week holiday. And so we really thank him for his time. Wilson Zhu, uh, over to you, around seven to eight minutes, please. 
And uh, please remember to unmute yourself. Oh, oh there you go. Perfect. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you guys have time I think that we are experiencing a little bit of technical difficulty Is with you, Wilson. Better? Yes, that's better. Yes, we can see your presentation now. Yes. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Please go Hi. ahead. Uh, well, very happy to be here. Um, and uh, maybe I'll offer some unique perspective because I was born in China, grew up in China, educated in the United States, and worked on the consumer side uh, for many, many years until I come back to join the end phone. And the end phone is known as a middleman. So hopefully my perspective is more like objective and in the middle. And uh, everybody's talking about the end of made in China. Uh, and I, it's interesting to see uh, the survey at the beginning. And there's no right answer or wrong answer. But let me talk about the end of made in China. What does that mean? Uh, first of all, let me share with you, in my opinion, the industry, Li and the phone, and you know, for many companies, the biggest gift, the best gift we have ever received, uh, Sino-US-China trade war and COVID-19. And you may ask why. But let me tell you that it is disrupting, the both are disrupting the supply chain and many companies' business. However, it's actually accelerating so many things we have been pushing to happen. So a big thank you. Uh, and I can tell you for Li and Feng and for 114 years history, we are experiencing a speedy transformation that we have been pushing and dreaming. But all of a sudden, everything's happened. For example, we are the world leader for digital, but customers feel very reluctant to use digital sample. They want to receive it, feel it, touch it. Today, they said, no, no, no. We are inspecting factories now with virtual tools, right? So things are actually happening. This is a much needed uh, disruption. I call them enablers. Therefore, as a result, the world is no longer flat. And we all know for many, many years, and the world is called flat, right? After, you know, Thomas Burke, the world is flat. Everybody's talking about the world is flat. And then the Fung brothers, they actually wrote a book competing in a flat world. And everyone thrived in a flat world. But last year, the special report called the world is not flat. And the world is very rocky now. Unbelievable, uh, you know, crisis and the danger in front of us. But I really like this quote from JFK that the risk comes together with an unbelievable opportunity. And let me tell you the three major change. Number one is from the world factory, China, to the borderless factory. Think about it. When we talk about China, Indonesia, Vietnam, what's that? It's a passport. It's a political product, right? Production has nothing to do with that. So when China is so good, everybody comes to China. We call it world factory. It's not China factory. It's world factory, but not anymore. What happened? It's become a borderless factory. Who cares 
where the product is produced, right? So if you look at this, this is ironic. China only added 3.6% value of an iPhone. Let's say the FOB is 200 uh, US dollars. But when it shipped to the US, it is called $200 trade deficit. And this is crazy, right? This is an international trade out of date completely. However, before you change the rule, you have to follow the rule. What do we do? You move that 3.6% process into Vietnam, into Indonesia. It is called made in Vietnam, made in Indonesia. It's that simple. And the Chinese government actually are encouraging the manufacturing guys going out of China. They call Zhou Tzu Qi. The faster, the better. But China is so comfortable, so competitive, and the infrastructure is so good. So the Zhou Tzu Qi, the moving out, is relatively slow. But it has been a trend, never stopped. So from world factory to borderless factory, that's trend number one. Here's a picture. This is, the, I was my first and the boss, CEO owner, and at the Canton Fair. That was 1989, my first job. And at that time, there's only one mission. My boss says, get all the production from Korea, from Taiwan, from Hong Kong to China, ASAP, that's it, right? So I did it in three years. This is 30 years later. I was at the Canton Fair again. This time the chairman and the CEO told me, go there and find China manufacturers who have production outside China, ASAP. I don't want any China production. So that's the difference between sourcing and production. And uh, this is 30 years. Look at what happens. Look at China already have $10 billion investment around the world for textile only. In how many countries? 100 countries. How many countries, companies are already working there? 1,000. Are they made in China? Not anymore. They call it made in Bangladesh, made in Egypt, made in Ethiopia, but it's all the brain, the knowledge, the material all in China. This is called from made in China to managed by China. This is exactly what Hong Kong experienced before. Made in Hong Kong to managed by Hong Kong. There's a book called Managed by Hong Kong. Not anymore, managed by China. And do not forget that, you know, the China manufacturing for a long time is for exporting. For what market? European market. I, I think Joanna showed US, US market the biggest, Europe is the second. You know what? China become fast growing consumer market and will be the largest consumer market. Are you going to manufacture a lot of products in Indonesia or India and export it to China? No, that will take a long time because the logistics and the efficiency right there in China, serving the largest growing consumer market, will keep the manufacturing capability in China, right? So don't move out of China if you are looking at China as a market. But who in the world is ignoring China as a growing market? Tell me. If you are selling to consumer, it's coming, right? So from world factory, to world market. And I know that quite a few senior guys lost their jobs because they didn't move production out of China during COVID-19. But I can guarantee you, if you move too fast, you lose your job because you miss the opportunity of the market. It's every supplier or the supply chain should be what? Demand driven. Ladies and gentlemen, demand driven. Where is the demand? And look at China, it's a booming consumer market, right? 
And I have been in China for the past seven months, and I just see how China successfully recovered. And it all depends on the consumer market inside. And you guys probably heard JD.com recently invested 100 million to a 140 years old company called the VM4. And I call this blue ocean opportunity. Why? Because Lian Fong never did China market. We started by selling to US market, European market. On Joanna's slide, there's a big tire growing that's China market. And it will grow so fast like a pizza, right? And the big piece will be China. So if you look at this, what's the opportunity? Blue ocean. Number one, you get into the largest, fastest growing consumer market. Number two, you can sell nothing unless it's on e-commerce in China. Many people come to uh, China and open their brick and mortar stores and fail the mineral way. But in China, everything is delivered by a motorcycle, right? So unbeatable for blue ocean opportunity for the largest consumer market and for e-commerce platform. So you can see that. And when we talk about China, I have a quote to share with you. I kept it for many. You know, when, when, when one individual spent a week in China, he writes a book because, he, you know, I actually had a, a journalist spend one week with me in China. He re, she really wrote a book, right? And one month write an article. Why? Because you realize you know so little about China. If you spend one year, you really write nothing. That's why for many, many years, I don't write anything about China because I realize that how little I know. And there are so many books written, don't spend money and don't waste your time on China. I'm a big believer on when goods do not cross borders, soldiers will. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here not talking about international trade, global trade, supply chain only. We are really talking about global peace. We are really talking about international relationship, aren't we? Think about US-China relationship, right? And this is the oath that I took when I become citizen of the United States. And at that time, my English was poor. I had no idea what I said. I went back on the internet and after I get home, I realized, oh my God, if there's a war happened between China and the US, and I have to bear arms and fight against China. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope it is still politically okay and acceptable for me to tell you the truth. I love China and I love America. There's not right. many places I can say that now, but I can Thank tell you. you, I want to do something to prevent the war from happening. The trade war already happened. And if you look at history, the trade war is always the beginning of a military war. Great. Uh, Wilson, at, if you can just take uh, just the, one or two minutes uh, to wrap up. Network. Look uh, at Wilson, can you, the, Wilson, can you uh, just take one or two more minutes to wrap up? For the factory that Li and Hong have built in the past 114 years, then you know why I say the world has changed. Forget about the country of origin. We are where the production makes most sense. But we are managing that from China, from our regional headquarters. Last but not least, I want to share a poem I really like very much. This is a poem from, Qing, uh, from Song Dynasty. Basically, the barriers are compared as all the mountains in this poem. And that is all this um, disruption, COVID-19, sign the US trade war. The river is really prosperity, shared prosperity. And you can never stop it, but it will have a lot of change. And the river is global peace. You cannot stop it. And the river is Globalization, you cannot stop it, but there will be many, many challenges along the, 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 the site. 
but together we are going to overcome. Here is the point. Great. Thank you very much, Wilson. Thousands of mountains try to block a river's flow. Only try to make it run faster and sing louder day and night. At last, the river reaches the foot of the mountain. Tang Tang Xi and flows majestically by leaving the mountains far behind. Thank you very much. This is my uh, WeChat. It's only a public account, it's only in Chinese. If you read Chinese, uh, welcome to keep contact. And it's a great, great platform here. And uh, I will be. Uh, part of the uh, panel discussion and uh, be happy to continue to communicate with everybody. Thank you. Great, thank you, Wilson, for your words of wisdom and also your practitioner's experience anecdotes. Um, greatly appreciate that. Now, um, next up, we have Tad Ishikawa. Tad is the general manager for Mitsubishi Corporation in Hong Kong. And I think that it would be interesting um, from his practitioner's perspective to give us, um, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, companies that are outside of the US and China um, and, you know, from, from their, their experience. So over to you, Tad, if you can uh, keep it around seven to eight minutes, thanks. Thank you. Yep, I'll, I'll promise I'll keep it short. Um, thank you. Um, just a disclaimer, I'm from Mitsubishi, but I'm not from the motors or electric. Um, I'm from the trading arms of Mitsubishi, so we're pretty heavily involved in the um, supply chain. And I think I'm here because this article came up in September. Uh, by Nikkei Asia Review, reporting that the 1,700 Japanese company applied for the U-turn government funding to Japan from China. But um, for us, um, such news isn't news at all because we've been hearing this exodus from China for ne in nearly a decade. So given all the news, and if it's true, I wonder how many Japanese are left now in China. Um, the fact is, uh, this 1,700 application is the um, second batch of the funding. And if, I, if you look at the first batch in June, most of them are SMEs. Uh, which many doesn't even have a factory in China. Uh, like um, Johanna has said, this funding needs to increase domestic production or uh, focusing on resilience of medical or public health related PPE supply. So it is not a program to supply company to come back to China, from China in the first place. Now let's say hypothetically all the 1700 company um, that is told to apply have um, factory in China and will go out. It's roughly about 10% of all the, all the Japanese companies operating in China. Usually, when we have a survey in Japanese chamber in the mainland, there's about 5 to 10% always considered falling out. And of course, there are a number of companies who come in every now and then. So if you, if you have you know, this circulation continues, I don't think mass exodus of Japan Inc. is happening. Well, when I see Japanese companies stance with China in terms of supply chain, there are actually, I guess, two conflicting trends. One is, um, I'm just going to you know, um, go over what Johanna or um, Wilson have said, but one those who sees China the market and strengthening its commitment by increasing domestic procurement ratio. Uh, take Toyota, for example. Uh, China counts about 20% of world sales after the US and exceeds their sales in Japan. That's why they invested R&D in Shenzhen, as well as their affiliate Aishin and Asahi Glass increased its automotive parts production capacity in 2019. And of course, there are who stays in China, but diversified parts of their operation to extend into Japan, so-called China, uh, China plus one strategy. And I think there are two factors. Um, one, uh, such as uh, Rico, Kyoto, Sharp, and Fujifilm did move their part of their operation to Vietnam, Thailand in 2019 because they were making product for US market. So they've done so to avoid the tariff rule, but it doesn't mean that they have pulled out the China completely. And of course, there's the con uh, contingency or resilience, resilience part of it. Uh, take PPE, for example. Uh, Japan did face the challenge uh, of securing the mask and PPE during the COVID crisis, early stages. And this made them recognize that the over-dependency in China or elsewhere could be risky, and therefore have decided to bring it, its factory back to Japan. Uh, we used to use call JIT just in time when we talk about the supply chain. But after COVID, JIC, just in case. 
as it seems to be a buzzword for most of them. Uh, diversification for the sake of protecting themselves in short supply seems to be a trend uh, given after the post-COVID crisis. And I'm just going to go over what Johanna has said, but according to the recent report by Jetro, it's kind of HKTDC in Japan, um, popular destination among the region is Vietnam, which 24% said they might think about it, and Thailand, because we used to have a, a lot of um, car companies uh, making production there. But China plus one trend has been there for 2010. Uh, for Japanese, because you might forget, but the, you know, China and Japan has a difficult time uh, during those, those, those time, and increase of wages were the main reason at the time. And the recent report by this Jetro has kind of same results, showing China plus one has gained momentum somewhat after U.S.-China tension and the COVID this year, of course. But again, I want to emphasize that they do continue to have production in China. Reason being, China is their market, labor skills are much higher, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. I'll stop here uh, at this point. I might be able to touch upon, you know, what's going and what, what will be my view for going forward. Over to you, David. Great, great. Thank you very much, Tad, for your insights, um, especially the one about uh, Japanese companies that have done a U-turn back to Japan probably are the smaller of the SMEs that actually did never, uh, never have production bases to begin with in China. Um, so I'm now, uh, I'd like to move over to a moderated discussion for about like around 10 minutes. Um, and, you know, while we're doing a moderated discussion with me and the panelists, I'd like to remind the audience to ask your questions via the chat function um, in the Zoom uh, toolbar. So uh, please feel free to engage with us um, and I'll try to uh, make sure that I touch on all the questions over there. Now, this is a question to all our panelists here. Um, especially with, um, with the pandemic on, fresh on our minds, uh, especially with um, China um, uh, demonstrating, uh, especially over this past week during Golden Week, that they have pretty much been able to, uh, to contain the, the, the pandemic completely and that the economy is seeing an economic rebound. Um, and so just thinking about the, uh, in a post-pandemic world, what, what do you think the ultimate impact is on uh, China's supply chains um, from this COVID-19 uh, catalyst. So maybe, uh, you know, maybe if we can start over with, um, with Joanna. Uh, if you can remind uh, you uh, to, uh, to unmute yourself, not great. Right. So, I mean, I think the pandemic has definitely accelerated a lot of this digitization and automation trends, which Wilson already alluded to. And I think when it comes to kind of digitization automation, I mean, China, relative to other economies, are still very competitive in that space and the ability to kind of benefit from that sort of digitization automation. And I don't know, I, I'm actually wondering, because on the one hand, there is still this desire, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. So I, I think resilience is still important. So you want just in case, as Tad Ishikawa was saying, okay, maybe you have one alternative sourcing. But I do think uh, maybe this COVID-19 COVID episode may have actually made production potentially more sticky in China. Because for one thing, uh, it kind of highlights, because again, China's do outperforming everyone else, right? In sort of a dealing with a pandemic and recovering from the pandemic. So even before the pandemic, China was also an, was already an important end market. Post pandemic, China may have become an increasingly even more important end market relatively in proportion to other markets, just because we have all the other markets doing relatively badly, for example. For example, India is gonna have a very, very deep contraction this year. So you have to kind of do the calculus on that. And then second, I think, at first, when there was a big disruption in supply chain because COVID hit China first, everyone was scrambling for, oh my God, there's going to be a supply chain disruption from China. And then it, the focus was all, okay, we got to diversify our sourcing. And maybe that's why the earlier survey of Amcham talking about desire for alternative sourcing was much higher. But that was a survey published in April that I think was done in March. That was a time when China was still at the heart and others didn't really filter in. But I think as the months went on, um, you know, it actually came out that China managed it much well. And actually, if you look at it's ironic because if you look at China's export market share globally, it actually peaked in 2017. It kind of came down a little bit 2018, 2019. It actually surged again uh, in the last couple of months because basically China was able to normalize production a lot faster. So I don't know. I think to me, uh, if anything, I'm, I'm sort of looking at these mixed trends. I would have to say in aggregate, uh, if it was, you know, I, I think it actually may have helped 
potentially uh, kind of highlight the stickiness of China. I still think there's a China plus one that hasn't changed, uh, but it may have actually made China a more compelling story in terms of production. I think the only place where it changed a little bit is on the technology space, because obviously the pandemic has escalated. There was already a strategic rivalry between US China and you know how it is, right? When, when times are tough, you wanna to blame other people. So I just worry that the geopolitics post-pandemic is gonna be more complicated. So maybe the mm. one angle that maybe has complicated things to China is maybe on the technology angle side, but in other production side, it, it, to me, it, maybe it actually made China more compelling at the margin. Oh, very interesting. And just shifting gears, as you said, the geopolitics, now this question over to Wilson. Uh, how does Lian Fong view uh, current U.S. Uh, domestic politics as we head into uh, the U.S. presidential election. Are you tracking closely how a Biden presidency could potentially upend um, U.S.-China tensions? Is that a reset button? Um, are you guys waiting for the new president uh, administration next year to see if you need to potentially um, re-strategize uh, your operations? How does geopolitics fall into this? Oh, can you please unmute your, uh, yes. Well, first of all, it's a very good question, right? But for a company that have 114 years of history, so we look at things beyond three months, actually three months, uh, if we change the president, we'll, be, we'll have a new president in January, right? And, uh, you know, if Trump wins, that's another four years. But four years is a very short period of time in our history, and especially in world history, right? So we look at it at the long term. But you know, obviously, without short-term win, you cannot win the long term. So we are fully prepared for any uh, you know, presidential election result. Uh, but I believe, you know, clearly, probably everybody will agree that if Biden wins, probably that it will become a little bit more normal and because that's expectation of the world. However, even if Trump wins, and I believe uh, it will be much more realistic. It's much more real because if you want to done anything in four years, and leaving legacy behind you. You need China, no matter what. We have to understand right now, it's all about election. And in election, and uh, you have to blame other people. And this time, unfortunately, that China is a scapegoat. That's okay. I think China handles well. You know, hey, I just wait until I see the result. But no matter who is the president of the United States next time, I believe China and US relationship will get better. How fast? Depends on who will be, right? But one of the things, go back to your previous question, mm -hmm. really, if you look at disruption and the, the trade war, one thing every company realized is risk management. China used to be and still a very strong, very big basket. But to put all eggs in one basket, no matter how efficient you are, you are against your grandma's wisdom, right? So your basket may be strong, but the basket may fall on the floor. Then your eggs are still broken, right? The reason is that the trade war, so the diversification of production doesn't mean you're abandoning China. Chinese government are systematically, strategically helping manufacturers go out. So change the country of origin. But you know, every product, every manufacturer need at least 25 to 50 suppliers. They are in China. And even when garment manufacturing move to India, you know what? The fabric is produced in China, okay? So just looking at the finished product, like the iPhone, as made in China, is a completely wrong concept. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. And while we're on the question of politics and government, uh, perhaps this question over to you, Tad. Uh, Japan has a new prime minister. Uh, he's widely touted as the continuation of previous uh, prime minister Shinzo Abe, and uh, and so investors and um, uh, participants think that we'll have um, a, a, a pretty smooth continuation. Is that your thought there? And what is the impact, any potential policy changes Japan will have um, for supply chain management with China? And perhaps how, how will the Japan-China relationship uh, improve or potentially deteriorate over uh, uh, Prime Minister Suga's um, you know, leadership? Thank you. Um, very good and tough questions because he's been here only a, a month or so. But overall, I think, um, it, said that he will carry on Mr. Abe's legacy overall, but because I think he's pretty much spent his most of the career on domestic policy. So we'll have to see how it goes on the foreign policy. But I guess um, talking about the supply chain, being domestic focused means that he has been focusing on reviving the rural areas of Japan uh, bringing, by bringing in tourists, especially inbound passengers from China and Hong Kong. And through TPP, um, Abe administration have encouraged SMEs and farmers to export their products abroad. So these are the successes during the um, Abe period, which Mr. Suga took leading role. So I think he would also see China as a market in that sense. Um, but on for the national security, I think he would pretty much follow with what Mr. Abe has done, meaning a strong US-Japan alliance and strengthening the ties with India and Australia, like they had in the Quad meeting. And the island issue will continue to be the center of gravity of Japan against China. And for foreign equality, I think, and I hope he will carry on the legacy of Mr. Abe of taking a leading role in promoting TPP. Um, we believe TPP is useful for setting not only free trade zone, uh, but promote fair trade and investment based on high standards and rules. Uh, this, I think for the um, supply chain will surely uh, show you the stable supply uh, within the nation and within the, uh, within the region for the common rule. So though it's getting difficult, uh, we've been saying that Hong Kong should still um, you know, join TPP on her own right. But for him, I guess the worst scenario uh, for him and Japan is to have a new prime minister every year that we did in 90s and early uh, 2000s. We've been competing with the Italians for that. Uh, but the stability that Mr. Abe brought have changed Japan's role uh, in international politics as well as structural Japanese businesses. So whether he would have a long term would be the key for the you know, uh, for this prosperity. And one point I may add to Josh, um, um, Johanna's point is that for Japan, you know, we've been talking about decoupling with China as well, uh, but um, there are, I guess, two aspects that we, you know, maybe for the industries and, you know, uh, related to national security, such as data sensitive technology, perhaps it could happen. But, you know, at Sony and Toshiba have applied exemption uh, with the trade for Huawei. I think this China as a market will make it difficult to just cut it off. And, you know, talking about the medical supplies of that resilience, what we usually talk about, um, you know, among our corporates is that should the COVID is over, I think these companies in Japan producing masks will go bankrupt because who would buy $10 mask compared to $1 mask made in China? I think, you know, it, and it, it doesn't make any economic sense. So I guess, you know, uh, like um, Johanna said, it's, I think it's a matter of resilience or stock, uh, not the matter of the flow of supply chain. And, you know, we still think China as a market plays a role, you know, a huge role. And also people may forget that China being a main source of production plays a you know, strong, uh, well, critical role for Japan. Uh, I heard that one of the factories in Guangdong, that their scale was so high that they cannot be replaced by even the right Japanese. And of course, there's, um, I guess, the, the question in the chat box, but there are mutual interests between Japan and China. What will be, you know, would there be a Trump, Mr. Trump's problem if Japan and China work on healthcare? Uh, food security, global warming, air pollution, or Toyota sell uh, fuel cell vehicle in China? I don't think so. So I think many Japanese companies are looking into these areas or the mutual interest as a prospective area without any political risk over to this. Great, thank you. Now, just moving over to audience Q&A, just a reminder to ask your question in the chat box. Um, we have about uh, 10, 15 minutes left. Uh, first question from the audience to Joanna, if you can chat, can, can your insights um, on the Chinese in, uh, growing urbanization, um, how does this potentially impact the supply chains in China? 
I mean, you know, usually when people think about urbanization, I think that's a, it's a way to kind of generate some productivity growth, especially in services sector, you know, create more higher income jobs, etc. It, it's, it's another pathway for kind of development to create a broader consumer market, you know, moving people from low productivity, rural area, you know, where I guess incomes are much more stagnant, but and moving them to more higher productivity, uh, again, could generate a middle class, and that's obviously good for kind of growth. And maybe when it comes to supply chain, again, it's all about, you know, uh, we mentioned, again, part of the, part of how you configure supply chain is also importance of where your end market is. And so to the extent that, you know, um, that, that can generate growth and continue consum consumption growth in China, it will make China share of the pie bigger. Because obviously, if you compare China, there's a lot more room for urbanization and rising incomes on the back of urbanization than there are for more developed countries. Uh, but of course, the flip side is, you know, obviously, as incomes grow up, you know, then, then you know, supply chains will just naturally migrate, right? You're going to move away from sort of, you know, you know labor, labor intensive, low, low value added manufacturing to less developed countries. And then China will kind of move up the value added chain. The other thing that we're also seeing in sort of trade flow is, that the services component of value added of, of, of manufacturing is rising. So it's not just the assembly kind of low-end manufacturing. Services do matter. And a lot of the services value added, you know, skills are generated in urban centers, you know, whether it's design or marketing or those type of service value added component. And usually the best ideas come from agglomeration of people together in a space to kind of exchange ideas of better ways to do things. So I think that's where, and actually you already see this in the data. So if you look at OECD data of trade and value added, actually China services, we always think of China as goods manufacturing, but actually China services value added of, of exports has actually grown quite a lot as well. So I think that's where you see the migration as China moves up the value added chain, more and more jobs are created in services, more services value added are created. A lot of that happens in urban centers and there's a lot more room for that growth because China is still, you know, we're still not yet, you know, we're only partially urbanized. And so maybe that's where the migration could happen. Great. Thanks for that, um, that comment about China transitioning to a services economy. Um, and then uh, the next question over to you, Wilson. Can you talk more about the trend um, in China about moving production uh, versus moving sourcing? Uh, is this specifically to the finished goods versus the raw material? And then I have a personal question about, you know, recent sanctions on Chinese cotton. Uh, Chinese cotton accounts for around 22% of global cotton production, 86% um, of which is produced in Xinjiang. Uh, so how significant is this you know, Chinese cotton import ban um, for, for textile manufacturers that you deal with? How has it affected your business? Uh, thank you. Two, two questions. Uh, both are very, uh, you know, tough. Let me go to the uh, cotton first. Ironically, that the, uh, while China's production uh, of the cotton are uh, largely produced in the Xinjiang area, it has never been a significant portion for exporting business because for many, many reasons, the imported cotton are actually far better uh, in terms of price, in terms of quality, ironically. So you can imagine that most of the uh, domestically produced cotton are domestically consumed, okay? So when this ban uh, actually imposed, we did extensive research and uh, also monitoring. What we find is surprisingly, what a small percentage of China produced cotton in general, including Xinjiang, are actually used for our production. Okay, so it, it becomes literally no issue. No issue because we don't use it because we can buy cotton at a much more productive and uh, productive way and uh, lower price because the imported cotton once becomes fabric, really export, there's no duty paid and the quality is much better, the global market, okay? So that is a history for many, many years, not just today. Going back to sourcing and production, I think Joanna said it so well, as China becomes the uh, managed by China, so China becomes a more sourcing hub than production hub. 
where I can tell you why the export is going up. Because fabric produced, fabric usually moving out of China, out of production country, five years at least after manufacturing of garment, because it requires capital intensive industry investment. Unless I'm 100% sure there's a five or 10 or 15 years of business opportunity. I'm not going to build a fabric mill, but I can build a garment factory, not a problem. You know, so the, the uh, fabric mill is a far more capital intensive investment. It's usually 10 years behind manufacturing. So China right now, I can tell you, it's 75% of fabric production. So, you know, even though when you hear, you know, COVID-19, I have a lot of deliver problem for, for garment. A lot, most of the fabric are from China. But now China is strategically and systematically moving fabric production around the world. Not necessarily because of US-China trade war. I think China said it well. These things are lagging, you know, indicator. And when they move, what they move is what we call close to the needle point, meaning fabric produced close to where garment produced. This is strategic important. Why? Then you have any trade war. I don't care. Fabric is right produced here, right? So you have to, fabric have to be closed, produced close to, you know, when we started the BNM, even polyester bags are produced in China, now in Vietnam. So there's an entire unseen supply chain, unbelievably powerful, are following what you see consumer manufacturing. You don't see it. And the machinery, are booming because they are made in China. And, you know, Trump talks about bringing manufacturing jobs uh, to the United States. Maybe, and, but it's only when he and Xi Jinping reach an agreement because it can only happen by Chinese manufacturing. I recently visited, uh, you know, automated Chinese manufacturing for apparel, you know, my God, when you walk into the factory, you were shocked. This is a highly sophisticated, automated manufacturing for apparel that I have never seen in my life. And I've been doing this for 30 some years. So that actually is really worth to move that production into the United States. Why? Then you have really short lead time then you can really respond to the demand of the consumer, you know? So that day will come, but we need Mr. Xi Jinping's help. Then the US-China, uh, the US manufacturing job will come back. But I can tell you, it's not going to hire a lot of people. Thank you. Great, Great. thank you. And uh, just switching gears um, over to Tad, um, one of the questions from the audience about, um, about perhaps Japanese manufacturing competitiveness compared to China. And will perhaps this new 2.2 billion US dollar fiscal package offered by the Japanese government and moving Japanese manufacturing plants um, out of China back to Japan, could that potentially boost um, Japan's manufacturing edge? And how, how do you see you know, Japan's edge against say China or South Korea you know, going forward? Thank you, a very tough question, but I think um, the fundamental problem of Japan is lack of work, worker uh, compared to China. Um, although, you know, we may be able to um, solve so many workers or the um, R&D into cutting edge technology, but when it comes to production, uh, I think we have to admit China is far better um, in terms of production, those um, edges. And I will echo to Wilson, what you have said, but the, um, the automation in the factory in China, I guess, far exceeds um, the one in Japan. Because, you know, we're, we're now starting to discuss how we could utilize 5G in the factory in Japan, where in China it's already been introduced. 
So I guess in terms of sophisticated um, uh, factory, I guess China still has um, you know this strength more than Japan in when in when it comes to I guess production of like garment or you know many things you know I guess consumer goods. But when it comes to perhaps you know um, other type, um, I'm not sure you know what will be Japan's focus at this point. But uh, when it comes to I guess automotive um, mobility and all those kind of things, yes, you know Japan may be able to compete with China in that end. But you know we're talking about supply chain here, so I think I would imagine about the, you know the focus is more like mass production. But I think I have to admit that the China has you know far exceeded Japan in that case. Very good. Uh, well, we are coming close to an end with our discussion here, but before we, um, we, we go, we have one more polling question that I'd like um, our participants um, to uh, look at. It's, so the question is, in a post-pandemic environment, will COVID-19 ultimately strengthen or weaken China's dominance in the global supply chain? Great, if we can see the results here. Ah, interesting, about an even split uh, between strengthening, weakening, and staying the same. Um, great. Well, I'd like to, since we've finished all our questions with our audience here, I'd just like to sum up some of our main points from today's uh, discussion. But before I do, I'd like to give perhaps one minute uh, to each participant panelist today, if you'd like to uh, kind of encapsulate uh, what the future of supply chains for China will be. It could be one word or one sentence. So perhaps uh, maybe Joanna, we're starting with you. One word is a tough thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, supply chain is driven by many, it, it's a constant moving organic process that is influenced by many multifaceted interlocking factors. Pandemic is only one. There's US-China tension. There's liberalization of China's markets and what reforms they're going to do. There's so many moving parts. So I think the only thing is, again, there's no one size fits all but you definitely cannot exclude. I mean, the narrative of moving out of China is an overplayed, over-exaggerated narrative. I think that's the message that we should kind of highlight. Very good. And perhaps over to you, Wilson. Okay. Well, I, I feel that I was invited to support Joanna all <laughs> the session. Everything she said is so right, but I have a lot of evidence to support her. One thing she mentioned, it's really from the economics uh, you know, perspective is, will these manufacturing jobs generate middle class as it did in China? Maybe the last country is Vietnam. What I want to say is, I think the world changed so much. And that in the future, the labor, the number of workers, and the low wage labor may not play such an important role. It will be in five, 10 years, but don't worry about when these countries are all become rich. Are we going to move factory to the moon? No. And uh, I don't think, you know, one of the famous quotes I always remember from the old minister in the Middle East is the Stone Age ended, not because we are running out of stone. Today, I think, you know, it, the Stone Age finished because we have steel, we have copper, right? And again, the oil age will end, not because we are running out of oil, because we have new energy. The labor intensive industry will end, not because of the lack of population, it's because of technology. So the world has changed. Are we ready? Thank you. Right. And over to you, Tad. Any last uh, remarks, comments? 
I think it's not fair that I agree with the last speaker after Wilson and I guess Joanna. I think pretty much follow what they have said. But I guess, you know, to just echo what Wilson said, I think, you know, talking about supply chain China, I think the, the, the one word that what Wilson has said is don't make your decision too early. I think, yeah. um, you know, China will be a largest, you know, uh, uh, market for many of our companies. And will you step away from that um, for the sake of, you know, uh, supply chain, um, diversification, and others. I think it's time that you stop and think about how you're going to do. That's all. Sure. I would, I would perhaps offer a counterpoint um, if I had to play devil's advocate. I would say that COVID-19 uh, very much uh, laid bare some of the geopolitical issues at hand between U.S. and China, right? So if you think that, like, my enemy's enemy is actually, like, we should partner together to defeat a common enemy. But we haven't seen that at all, right? So what does this mean? It means that there are structural issues at play uh, between U.S. and China, and perhaps uh, you know some of the other uh, players out there. And so my point is actually um, that we are moving into uh, perhaps a, a new um, a new paradigm um, in terms of international relations. So if I have to put on my like international relations hat or my geopolitics hat, I would say that this paradigm is very different. As Wilson alluded, the world is not flat. And perhaps we're now in a world, it's one world, many systems, or the world seems like it's getting balkanized, right? Just look at the technology decoupling uh, between what's going on. And so I, I would almost add, offer this counterpoint to say that it will be quite interesting how geopolitics will potentially drive um, the longer term impact of supply chains um, in China. So, and with that, I'd like to um, close our webinar today. I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Joanna, Wilson, Tad, as well as our, um, our introducer, Sally, uh, uh, for um, their insights today. Uh, this was a very riveting discussion and I've learned quite a bit. So thank you and goodbye and see you next time on the next AmCham webinar. Thank, thank you, you everyone.